I think it can be very difficult uh, sometimes to, to imagine how biblical eschatology, that is what the Bible teaches about the future, can relate to work. But actually it's really important for our understanding of the meaning and purpose of work. Think of it this way, if you are working in a job and you never get any feedback, you never get any evaluations. Um, perhaps you've had a boss who's like that. You never, get, you never know whether you're doing a good job or a bad job. You try to find out, but nobody ever really communicates. You start to wonder whether you're actually making any difference, whether there's any point in what you're doing. And I think that that's the very positive way of understanding the biblical doctrine of judgment, that at the end of history, um, when uh, God wraps this particular era up and heaven comes down to earth, at that transition there's going to be a judgment. Every one of us, Christians included, are going to be judged for our behaviour. That's not for Christians about salvation, but the Bible is very clear that we are going to face judgment in terms of what we've done with our lives and what we've known of God. And that judgment, that evaluation, actually is what gives life and work its meaning because God really is going to say to us we hope well done good and faithful servant and we're told in advance that there's a fire test for this uh, Paul talks about this in the book of Corinthians the letter to Corinthians and the fire test is really all about our work being purified what has been done on the basis of faith and hope and love in response to God's initiative in our lives, what we know of God's truth in scripture, what's built on the enduring word of God in our work, survives that fire test. The rest of it kind of gets burnt up, it's wood, hay and stubble, but what's left is gold, silver and precious stones. And that element of our work that's been purified somehow, and we don't fully know how of course, makes it through and it becomes an offering in the new heavens and the new earth. There's a connection that Paul sees between the resurrection of Christ and our work now. That is, Christ has been raised from the dead. He had a physical body that ate fish. And he said, a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. So the material body that he had was good. It was made perfect. And that means that there's some continuity between the material creation as it is now and after Christ returns in the new heavens and the new earth when uh, sin is done away with. It's a mystery to know how much of that is, but it's worth thinking about. Paul makes the connection, 1 Corinthians 15, 58, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because you know that your work in the Lord is not in vain. That's because of the resurrection of Christ. And that shows a continuity between the physical world as it is now and as it will be. All right, in this lesson, we're going to turn our attention to the future. What does the Bible teach us about where we're headed? And what difference does it make for how we live now? Most Orthodox Christians understand that a time of severe judgment is coming, followed by the return of Jesus. And as God's people, we look forward to a future in heaven with Jesus, where there'll be no more tears and sorrow and death and pain. But a big question for many Christians is this. What is the future destiny of this world that we live on now? Will it be completely destroyed in the coming judgment? And if so, how does that affect how we think about our lives and especially our work now? The church over the last 200 years has been sharply divided on this question. On one side are people like the great evangelist, Dwight L. Moody, he likened this world to a sinking ship. In fact, he once famously said, I look upon this world as a wrecked vessel. God has given me a lifeboat and said, Moody, save all you can. Now, Moody was a devout and a highly gifted Christian, and God used him to accomplish many great things. And yet he viewed this world as essentially doomed. Will it all burn? Moody and many others would seem to say yes. This same view has been popularized by Hal Lindsey in his hugely influential book that was published in 1970 called The Late Great Planet Earth. That's a book I read when I was a young Christian and it shaped my view of the future of end times. And for millions of Christians around the world who've adopted this pessimistic view, 
it's resulted in a kind of a passivity towards the brokenness and the poverty and the injustice that it confronts us here and now. Because if everything will burn except for saved souls, well then why don't we just simply hang on until Jesus returns when we're evacuated off of this doomed planet into heaven? If you think this way, well then it's reasonable to believe that your work here and now, it doesn't really matter. Why work to make this world a better place if it's gonna be destroyed in the end? Why polish the brass on a sinking ship? The only real, the only work of real significance, according to this view, is evangelism. It's rescuing saved souls off this doomed planet. Ideas have consequences. The understanding of the end times has deeply impacted at least two generations of Christians all around the world, and the consequences have been profound. Take, for example, the great missionary Amy Carmichael, probably one of the greatest missionaries in the first half of the 20th century. Her missions, missionary activity took her to Japan and later to Sri Lanka and then finally to India, where she was horrified to discover the ritual abortion and female infanticide were commonly practiced as they continue to be in India even today. In addition, many of the young women that she served were being systematically sold off as slaves to nearby pagan temples, and they were being raised as cult prostitutes. Within a few years of her arrival, Carmichael established a mission to protect and to shelter these girls. And though she had to suffer persecution from various Hindu sects, as well as the bureaucratic resistance of the British colonial government. She built an effective and dynamic ministry that was renowned for its courage and its compassion. And yet, incredibly, when newly arrived missionaries arrived in India from England, they challenged Carmichael. They said that her work to build an orphanage and a school were quote unquote worldly activities. And they distracted her from the more important task of saving souls. Why work for the blessing and the flourishing of India if it, along with the rest of the world, is going to be destroyed in the end? On the other side of this debate, you had Christians who held an entirely different view of the future destiny of this world. They aligned themselves with political progressives, and in doing so, many of them abandoned the core doctrines of the Christian faith, including the sinfulness of man, the need for personal salvation. They believed that it would be possible to organize societies here and now in such a way that a kind of utopia would result, a perfect society here and now on this side of Christ's return. And this became known as the social gospel movement. It reached its apex about 80 years ago, but it still retains influence today. One of its main spokesmen was a famous American journalist named Horace Greeley. And he wrote, the heart of man is not depraved. His passions do not prompt wrongdoing and evil. Evil flows only from social repression. If you give people full scope, free play, and perfect and complete development, then universal happiness must be the result. If you create a new form of society in which this shall be possible, then you will have the perfect society you will have the kingdom of heaven. So in other words, if our best and our brightest can just engineer society in the right way and create the perfect society, we'll have the kingdom on earth now. Lacking from this theology was any reliance on Jesus, on salvation through the blood of Christ. That was replaced by programs from the state and social uh, other social programs. And for the last hundred years, the church has basically been divided between these two warring views. But when we look to the scriptures, we find a different perspective than those that are offered here on either side. One of the most helpful pictures that we have of the end times comes from Jesus's parable of the weed and the weeds found in Matthew chapter 13. Starting in verse 24, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed into the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat, and then he went away. 
When the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, the weeds also appeared. So the servants of the owner came to him and said, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather the weeds, you uproot the wheat with them. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the weeds and bind them into bundles and burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. Later in the same chapter, Jesus provides an explanation of this parable. Starting in verse 37, he says, He who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is this world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the weeds are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of this age, when the reapers, excuse me, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age." The Son of Man will send out his angels. They'll gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness. And he'll cast them into a furnace of fire where they, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. But the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is a parable about the world now and what is to come of this world. For the field represents this world. And in this field, two things are growing simultaneously, side by side, the wheat and the weeds. The wheat represents the sons of the kingdom sown into the field by Jesus. The weeds represent the sons of the devil and the things that they produce, lawless actions that are displeasing to God. This parable critiques both sides of the debate over end times. To those who hold to a pessimistic view of the world, believing that things are only going to go from bad to worse, and when they get really bad, Jesus is going to come back and evacuate us out of this world before destroying it. This parable says, no, you're only looking at the weeds. <laughs> Rather, you should focus on the wheat, for it too is growing, it's bearing fruit. Focus on the work of the church around the world as the church grows and multiplies and it, as it obeys Christ's command to love God and neighbor in ways that bring a transforming change to communities and to nations. Sure, yes, there are weeds and they are also growing, but that is certainly not the full picture. To those who subscribe to the social gospel, believing that we can somehow create a utopia now through human wisdom, this parable says, no, <laughs> there will always be weeds and they will also continue to grow and multiply until the end. It's both naive and foolish to dismiss this reality. Utopia will only be realized in the age to come after the weeds have been gathered up and burned. And that job is something that God is going to do in his time. That's not our job. The parable of the weed and the weeds gives us a picture of the world that fits our experience of it. It fits reality because it's true. Because in our experience, we see God's redemptive plan and we see it advancing. We see churches growing around the world. We see Christians loving and serving their neighbors in countless ways, blessing others, blessing communities, blessing nations. And at the same time, we see Satan's counterfeit kingdom growing. We see deception, we see violence, tyranny, we see disease. And this darkness also seems to be increasing. By the way, have you ever noticed that our news media tend to focus only on the weeds? Now we have to be careful about this because it can lead us to a skewed and a pessimistic picture of reality. We hear about war and murder and natural disasters, but we don't typically hear about the Christian husband faithfully loving and serving his wife and children, or the Christian businessman who's out there working with integrity and creating products that bless and serve others. We don't hear about the Christian missionary in China who's rescuing abandoned baby girls, 
We don't hear about, for example, the explosive growth right now of the church in Iran, where people are coming to faith by the thousands through dreams and visions of Jesus. Instead, what do we hear about? We hear about ISIS. We hear about terrorist attacks. The reality in our world is that both the wheat and the weeds are growing, and they're bearing fruit side by side. Yet, God calls us to focus our attention on the wheat, not the weeds. He calls us to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We're to make this our passion, our life's focus. Now, we don't deny the reality of the weeds, but we remember that they will not last. When Jesus returns, he'll see to it that they are uprooted and burned. And then only the wheat will remain in its glory. We're to live now in the light of that future reality. We're to be the first fruits and the foretaste of a world that's yet to come, a world that will be completely purified of evil. Okay, I want you to listen really carefully to this. The wheat that is growing now on this earth will not be burned after Jesus re returns. It will be preserved. It will last. I want you to think about this because it has massive implications for your work. In answer to the question, will it all burn, we can say emphatically, no. Only the weeds will be burned. We who are the children of the king and the work that we do for Christ and his kingdom, and I believe that includes our creative activities done for the glory of God, done for the love of neighbor, this work matters to God. It matters eternally. It lasts. There's a continuity, in other words, between this world and the world to come. We do not escape this world to heaven. Rather, the Bible describes an age to come the age to come is a union of heaven and earth. In the end, we see heaven, God's dwelling place, in the form of the new Jerusalem coming down to this earth. The great English theologian G.B. Caird said it like this, Nothing from the old order, which has value in the sight of God, is disbarred from entry into the new. The treasure that men find up laid in heaven turns out to be the treasure and the wealth of the nations, the best that they have known and loved on earth, redeemed of all imperfections and transfigured by the radiance of God. N.T. Wright, the famous theologian, makes a similar point. He says, what you do in the present by painting, preaching, singing, sowing, praying, teaching, building hospitals, digging wells, campaigning for justice, writing poems, caring for the needy, loving your neighbor as yourself. This will last into God's future. They are part of what we may call building for God's kingdom. What exactly will this look like? Well, we can't say with certainty, for we see through a glass dimly. But the parable of the weed and the weeds teaches us that we can say with full confidence that our work now for his kingdom will not burn. It will be preserved and it will be revealed on the other side of eternity in its glory. Recently, we met a gentleman named Chris Johnson. He's a lighting and sound technician and engineer from Texas. And when he understood this, these truths that I'm sharing with you, it just transformed the way he saw his work. He basically shared his testimony this way. He said, you know, I came to realize that we were created to create and that God takes so much pleasure in us and in what we do that he sacrificed himself so that neither we nor our best creations would be burned up. How would you see your work differently if you knew that it was so valuable to God that he would preserve it in the age to come, that it would have eternal significance? Martin Luther once said, our whole life should be nothing but praise to God. Even if the Lord would return tomorrow, I would plant a sapling today. So how about you? What trees are you planting now that will last into eternity?